urology, and uh, we're trying to have more joint conferences with urology. Look forward to this uh, discussion this morning. Welcome, Chad Nuggan. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody to uh, this Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, I'll be, I'm Dr. Okafor. I'll be discussing uh, contemporary management of pelvic organ prolapse. Um, so first of all, what's a urologist talking to you about pelvic organ prolapse for? Um, I, I was, my residency was in urology. I trained in urology. Uh, but we also intersect with uh, gynecology in the sense that we uh, take a fellowship uh, to uh, train in uh, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Uh, so that's what I did. And uh, that's my uh, concentration right now. So uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, the objectives of this presentation, first of all, we need to, we're going to define, obviously, pelvic organ prolapse, uh, discuss incidence and epidemiology. Uh, we'll describe a proper evaluation of a patient with pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, we're going to identify treatment options and discuss uh, treat management options in special situations, which I'll, I'll concentrate on overactive bladder or stress incontinence, which often occur uh, concurrently with uh, prolapse. So what is pelvic organ prolapse? Uh, it's the descent of the anterior vaginal wall, the posterior vaginal wall, the uterus, or in the case of a hysterectomy, a vaginal vault. Um, also think of it as a loss of support for the uterus, bladder, colon, or rectum, whatever pelvic uh, viscera you have, leading to a prolapse of one or more of these organs into the vagina. So uh, the most common an analogy that's often used is the, the boat and the dock. So if you imagine the pelvic organs as the boat and the water as your uh, support, a pelvic floor support, and uh, the chains or ropes holding the boat in place as your ligament structures, if your pelvic floor is weakened or gone, as in the case in the picture in B, uh, you place, place more stress on the support structures like the ligaments. And with continuous, uh, you know, increase in stress, uh, they become even weaker, and eventually everything kind of drops. Uh, so, the pelvic floor we're mostly concentrated, mostly concerned with the uh, levator and eye muscles, uh, which consist of the uh, puborectalis, uh, and the pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus. They make up the levator and eye. They are the pelvic support structures. They keep everything from falling out. Uh, they're mostly innervated by the uh, pudendal and uh, a couple other nerves. Uh, and uh, they do a pretty good job of keeping everything inside, um, the abdominal contents from falling out. But then the, the miracle of life often happens. And uh, this scary picture shows what can happen. Uh, you know, the muscles tear. Uh, you have a large head coming through a small space. Uh, and that brings me to the risk factors for pelvic organ prolapse. So childbirth is obviously the number one, uh, specifically vaginal deliveries. Larger babies, uh, forceps delivery, surgical deliveries are higher risk. Uh, the higher the parity, the, the more likely you are to have pelvic organ prolapse. Usually caps out about two deliveries. Uh, there's an eight times increased risk. Uh, and after that, it sort of plateaus. Um, so if you think about it, only 4% of women with pelvic organ prolapse uh, have not had a pregnancy or delivery some, there's some other reason for that. And this diagram, this graph shows kind of like the relative risk and uh, with parity and prolapse. As, you, as I explained earlier, after the second delivery sort of plateaus, doesn't increase as much. So what happens with the vaginal delivery? It leads to uh, decreased muscle mass due to the stretching, uh, impaired muscle function, uh, sometimes segmental muscle atrophy, sometimes due to uh, nerve injury. Um, it may not be apparent until years later. And uh, there's been some basic science studies that shows, uh, and nerve latency studies that show uh, uh, damage to the nerves. Um, there are also other factors, and this brings us to the nature versus nurture argument. Uh, family history is one. If um, there have been studies that have shown, you know, uh, concordance with uh, family if the sisters or mother have pelvic organ prolapse. Um, race and ethnicity have also been um, analyzed. Uh, it's more common in Caucasian and Asian women than Latina and African-American women. 
uh, age, obviously, uh, with increasing age, uh, there's increasing uh, risk factors, uh, weakness in the pelvic floor, collagen disorders, neuromuscular disease. Uh, one risk factor that's pretty high up there is hysterectomy, prior hysterectomy. Back in the days, everyone got a hysterectomy for whatever reason, and uh, we're kind of seeing the effects of that uh, later on. Um, obviously, high BMI, uh, smoking, chronic cough, occupation. So your classic UPS worker, someone who's always lifting uh, stuff at work, uh, they also present often with uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, also, socioeconomic status has been identified as a risk factor, lower socioeconomic status. So how common is it? Uh, the prevalence has been historically placed at between anywhere from 4 to 10 percent, and this is based on symptoms. Uh, if you feel a mass or something bulging out into the vagina or feel like pressure in the vagina. Um, the more recent studies have placed prevalence a little higher, uh, but uh, population studies show, some population studies in uh, certain areas are showing, st it sits around that three to five percent still. Uh, so the lifetime risk of undergoing a single operation for prolapse and or incontinence uh, was, capped at, was uh, calculated at 11.1 percent by age 80. Uh, it accounts for about 600,000 surgeries uh, and uh, about $26 billion in uh, health care dollars. So it's uh, very prevalent. Uh, this graph shows you over a five-year period uh, how it changes. So pelvic organ prolapse is the far left here. You see it's between 3 and 4 percent uh, in prevalence. I kind of stayed, stayed, stayed steady over the 10-year period. Um, there are other pelvic floor disorders that happen as well, such as uh, fecal incontinence, uh, urinary incontinence, and if you combine one or more pelvic disorders, uh, prevalence rates uh, rise to the 30 percent range. So a lot of adult women have prolapse, but it's only symptomatic in a minority, and that's, if you take anything away from this talk, that's I, what I hope you take away from that. So how do you evaluate uh, women with uh, pelvic floor uh, disorders? Um, is the patient symptomatic? Uh, that's one of the first questions you should ask. Um, you can do, get that by history. And is it really pelvic organ prolapse? Uh, a lot of times they present to you with vague complaints and say, I, I feel like there's pressure. And especially if they're postmenopausal, this could all be attributed to uh, atrophic vaginitis. Uh, so don't always assume that they have prolapse, uh, and if you do an exam, you can definitely tell if they do or not. Uh, what type is it? You know, your physical exam will tell you which, com which compartment has prolapse. Is it the anterior, the posterior, the apex, or the, or the entire uterus? Sometimes the imaging may be helpful if you're uh, not sure, but it's often not required. Um, are, is there any associated incontinence? And I'll come back to this later, but uh, you know, it's important to kind of know from the get-go because it could affect the way you treat them. And it also uh, is important for counseling and the expectations of the patient. Uh, and then once you get all this information, you uh, look into uh, the appropriate treatment, which I'll go over uh, very briefly. So what kind of information do you need in the history? Uh, how long have they been symptomatic? How bothered are they? Are they? So usually uh, we have uh, patient surveys in the office which we utilize to determine the degree of bother, quality of life issues. And because um, oftentimes they come to you because they heard about this condition, they know they have it or they think they have it, uh, but they're not really sure they want to do anything about it. And sometimes the visit is just for reassurance and, you know, you have to uh, determine how much of a bother it is. Um, know about the obstetrical history, how many pregnancies, how many deliveries, uh, if there were any complications, things like that, gynecologic history, are they postmenopausal, premenopausal, any abnormal bleeding, is the patient sexually active? Uh, that's very important for surgical planning. Um, you know, look into the family history, any gynecologic malignancies as well. Um, what are the common symptoms that they complain about? Uh, bulge is number one, uh, often described as I feel like I'm sitting on a tennis ball or I feel like something's, you know, poking out of my vagina. Uh, sometimes they see it uh, by, you know, placing a mirror under. Uh, and sometimes there's bleeding. Uh, and commonly this is because of uh, irritation of the bulge uh, on the underwear, uh, if it's, especially if it's been out for a long time and if it's cr very chronic. 
Um, often have incontinence issues, uh, OAB complaints, overactive bladder, frequency urgency. Um, in severe cases of uh, complete diversion, they might have incomplete emptying or incomplete emptying, uh, which can lead to problems with uh, renal failure uh, because uh, the ureter has become kinked or the bladder becomes distended and they're unable to empty. Uh, they complain about straining to void. Sometimes they have to do manual reduction techniques to void, meaning basically placing their hand in the vagina to reduce the bladder in order to empty. Uh, sometimes they do the same thing for, uh, uh, to, em to defecate as well. So the DI symptoms include constipation, fecal incontinence, uh, uh, incomplete defecation. Uh, there are also sexual problems as well, dyspareunia and coital incontinence. And just generally pelvic discomfort, some people com complain of low back uh, discomfort. Excuse me. Um, so there's a lot of issues that go on and that you have to screen for. Um, and then when, when they mention these things, maybe in your clinic you could be seeing them for something else and they mention these things, you should assess for or a prolapse as well. So how do you assess? Um, I use a half speculum and uh, usually place them in uh, either uh, supine with legs up or if, if you cannot see it that way, sometimes standing helps because they don't, they, it tends to get worse with uh, increase when, when they stand over after several hours, then it tends to get worse or maybe at the end of the day after a long day at work. So if you can't see it, you know, in a, in a supine position, then have them stand and see if it, if it shows up. Um, you measure the type of, uh, the degree and type of uh, prolapse uh, and I'll briefly go over how we do that. Uh, the current uh, method we use is the POPQ, uh, Pelvic Organ Prolapse uh, um, Quantification. Uh, it uses specific numeric measurements uh, to measure all the, uh, the prolapse in all the compartments. The important thing is to evaluate all compartments. Just don't look at the one that's obvious, but look at the others as well. Uh, screen for potential uh, stress and incontinence uh, by reducing the prolapse and having the patient cough. Often I, I assess for PVRs or post-void residuals to see if there's uh, incomplete emptying. And uh, this cartoon just kind of shows a basic uh, exam without the speculum. As you can see in the Nolly Paris, uh, when you ask the patient to Valsalva, um, there isn't much prolapse. Uh, with the Paris uh, female here, uh, you can see uh, prolapse. We're not sure which segment is this. This is based on just looking at this alone, but you can see something has uh, uh, falling down to the level of the uh, introitus. Uh, we've changed uh, our way of assessing prolapse over the years. Um, currently, like I said, we use the uh, POPQ, uh, which uh, has, is divided into four stages. Um, prior to that, we were using the baiting worker classification, which is also divided into four stages. You don't need to know the details of this, obviously, uh, but just to kind of give you an idea where uh, the landmark for each one is different. For the pop cue, the landmark is the hymen, hymenal ring. So if anything is uh, one centimeter proximal to the hymenal ring, it's a stage one. If it's one, within one centimeter of the hymenal ring, it's a stage two. Uh, while on the old system, we used uh, half of the length of the vagina and the introitus as landmarks, which is kind of hard to do. Uh, so to summarize, uh, stage zero means no prolapse, stage one, some prolapse, but the most distal point is above the hymen, at least a centimeter above the hymen. With stage two, you have the distal point within a centimeter of the hymen or below. And uh, stage three, uh, the furthest point is uh, greater than one centimeter beyond the hymen, but less than the transvaginal length, minus two centimeters. And then you have complete diversion, which is everything is out. Um, a little bit too detailed here, but just to kind of give you uh, an idea of how we measure the POPQ, there's certain specific points. Um, I'll just say AA is uh, a fixed point, AP is a fixed point, and then when you have descent, you, you measure, I'll assume the hymenal ring is somewhere around here, you measure uh, descent in relation to the hymenal ring, and then you come up with all the numbers, uh, and eventually you can uh, go back to what the staging is. So that will bring us to treatment. Well, <clears throat> what kind of things should we know? 
So the most important thing to know is the future plans for childbearing. Is this patient going to have more children? Because you might plan to do a hysterectomy. You, you may, uh, is the patient sexually active? If um, the patient is not sexually active, you might plan an uh, obliterative procedure to just close the vagina in severe cases. And you also want to know the level of bother. <clears throat> so we have non-surgical treatments. Uh, the usual go-to for me is uh, pessary. Uh, these are plastic inserts which are placed in the vagina uh, to kind of push everything back uh, in pl into place. Uh, it could simulate post-surgical repair for the patient to see how they feel uh, if, the, if things were, uh, if things were uh, repaired surgically. Uh, the, there are several options for a pessary, as you can see here, it's, uh, it's abundant, and the uh, choice depends on what compartment has prolapsed. Um, obviously, there are a few contra uh, contraindications. Uh, if uh, the pa a patient has a pelvic infection, if the patient is non-compliant, meaning you put this in and you never see them again, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be trouble. And if they have uh, an ulcerated vagina to begin with, um, and if they have a silicone or latex allergy, obviously. And sometimes you may have more than one uh, trial fitting, meaning you try, these things come in different sizes depending on the uh, size of the introitus. So you have smaller ones, you have larger ones, and uh, it may take a trial and error to see what exactly fits and is able to stay in place. Uh, I usually offer this option for older, much older ladies and those that uh, do not want surgery but are significantly bothered. And uh, when they see the benefit, they often go for surgery afterwards. So how does it work? Uh, success rates are, you know, it all depends on the patient's uh, compliance. Uh, it varies from 41 to 74 percent. Like I said, multiple tries may be required for successful fitting. Uh, Long-term use varies quite a bit. Uh, it, it depends on the age of the patient, the type of pessary. Um, we've had, you know, a study which showed that 76% stuck to it at one year, and it came down to 53% at three years. Um, erosion is a long-term complication of pessary, obviously, so that applies to people who leave it in there and never take it out. Um, it's advised to take it out every few weeks uh, to uh, a month uh, or two and just wash it and then have the, have the vagina examined by professionals to see if there's any ulceration. Um, and uh, I what I do is uh, schedule constant follow-up to prevent complications. Another non-surgical option that's often overlooked is uh, physical therapy, uh, pelvic muscle, floor muscle training. Uh, this is used to reduce the symptoms particularly uh, and obviously patient involvement and, and uh, the motivated patient is key here. Um, and you need a competent and well-trained uh, pelvic floor therapist. They're, they're very good ones and they're very bad ones. Um, often biofeedback may be employed to teach uh, uh, the patient to identify the right pelvic muscles, uh, muscle awareness, uh, and to retrain the bladder in cases of overactive bladder. Uh, they teach them posture, uh, how to exercise the abdominals, and other core muscles that might help. So in uh, some cases, uh, you know, that might apply, in, especially in uh, low stage uh, of prolapse. Uh, I have a study here, the puppy study, which was a multicenter randomized control trial looking at uh, pelvic floor muscle training in women with prolapse. Uh, they divided them into control and intervention group. Uh, key inclusion criteria was symptomatic prolapse, uh, stages one to three. So one, one of my qualms with this study is that it's very rare to find a symptomatic patient with a stage one prolapse. It's often stage two or more, so I don't know how they presented. Um, so the intervention group had pelvic mu floor muscle training, and the uh, control group just had a leaflet to explain how to do the exercises. And the primary outcome that was measured was symptoms, prolapse symptoms uh, at 12 months, obviously using uh, patient surveys. Um, it, it, was, it was a grueling uh, study. The patients required a 16 week of pelvic floor muscle training appointments. So it wasn't uh, adhered to very much, but 66% of participants uh, completed the study uh, and they followed up at 12 months. Um, the prolapse symptoms were significantly less in the intervention group uh, compared to the control group uh, by 1.5 units as measured on the uh, survey. 
but uh, there was no difference in the change of the prolapse. So it doesn't really change the descent as much as the patient's feeling of how bad it is. So if, if uh, the bother is what's really uh, an issue and the patient doesn't want surgery, that's, a, that's an option. But obviously, in, in some cases, it might, in, in especially advanced cases, it might not work as well. Um, this study looked at vaginal pessary uh, in symptomatic uh, prolapse, and uh, they had uh, two parallel, uh, parallel groups. One had uh, just a pessary, and that was considered a control, and the other had a pessary and uh, exercises as well. Uh, they, uh, patients who were enrolled had stage one to stage three prolapse. Uh, in this one, the primary outcome was a uh, change in prolapse symptoms as well as, uh, as, well as quality of life. Um, and the scores decreased in both groups at 12 months. Uh, however, it was higher in the pessary and pelvic floor exercise group. So they saw in, um, decreased scores of the prolapse symptoms and uh, improvement in quality of life scores were higher. So uh, in some cases, uh, it's, like I said, uh, if it's a severe prolapse, you may not be able to um, rely just on pelvic floor therapy. So we move on to surgical repair. Um, so prior to doing surgical repair, you have to look at what the, uh, if there's any apical prolapse, uh, any significance of uh, ap apical prolapse has to be recognized. Um, if you do just a anterior repair or posterior repair on the rectal side and leave the apical prolapse, it almost the pressure almost transmits to the apex, and then the patient starts feeling symptoms again a few months down the road. Um, Preoperative imaging is often not necessary unless you suspect an enterocele or something peculiar going on. And uh, the key is to have more than one trick in the bag because you may go into the OR and just find a totally different situation than you were expecting. Uh, the exam in clinic is very uncomfortable, uh, and even though you have to be thorough sometimes, you may not be able to see everything you want to see as compared to when under anesthesia. So if something is a little different under anesthesia, be prepared to address it. Um, so this is the algorithm I kind of follow uh, when considering uh, repair. Uh, is this when, you, when the patient is considering surgery, are they sexually active? If they're much elderly, poor performance status, not, you know, not the type you want to keep on the table for too long, and they're not sexually active, you can consider an obliterative procedure uh, or copoclysis uh, to close off the vagina. Um, if they're sexually active and uh, <coughs> willing to undergo reconstructive options, then you go that route. Uh, the surgical approach uh, includes uh, vaginal and abdominal. The vaginal options include uh, suspension to the uterosacral ligaments or the sacrospinous ligaments or iliococcygeus without any mesh. Uh, and then you could use uh, mesh augmented repair, which I'll brief briefly discuss why I don't do it. And uh, abdominal repair, the no mesh option is the uterosacral suspension, which is often done in conjunction with a hysterectomy. And then the mesh repairs, which are the sacral copopexy or the uh, sacral hysteropexy, if you want to preserve the uterus. So the uh, classical operation is the uh, anterior copography, which is uh, which addresses uh, prolapse of the anterior segments, usually from the bladder. Um, the anterior vaginal wall is opened, and the uh, pubic cervical uh, fascia is dissected off the anterior vaginal wall. Uh, exposing uh, the uh, pubovaginal, uh, I'm sorry, the vesicle pelvic ligaments. So you, you go as lateral as possible and, and try to uh, placate uh, the vesicle pelvic ligaments in order to reduce the prolapse. Uh, success rates are very, uh, they go anywhere from 50 to 97 percent. I, I, I doubt this number, on the other hand, highly. They, they do recur quite a bit. Um, and uh, this is after a mean follow-up of uh, five to 60 months. You do the same thing on the posterior side. Um, you, you open up the posterior vaginal um, wall and you identify uh, the um, peri, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, perirectal fascia and you imbricate it and uh, bring it together to reduce the prolapse. Uh, often you do a perineal raffi to reduce uh, sort of to reduce the, the size of the introitus, and that can help. 
Um, and this with follow-up of three to 61 months, our success rates have been anywhere from 56 to 96 percent. Uh, what was done is sometimes when there was recurrence, the mesh uh, would be placed, a mesh, small uh, polypropylene mesh would be placed between the layers. Uh, but uh, that has turned out to be uh, not a good idea in a lot of cases. Um, if you have apical descent, um, there's a vaginal approach. Um, you have the uterus preserving technique of the sacrospinous hysteropexy, which I'll show you in just a bit, the, a diagram, and the non-uterus preserving, which requires a concomitant hysterectomy. So if you have uh, uterovaginal prolapse, uh, once the uterus is taken out, you can suspend the apex to the uterosacral ligaments. And then you have the obliterated procedures like I, I, I mentioned. So the sacrospinous suspension, so you have on the uh, so in the spinous process to the sacrum, you have the sacrospinous ligament, and that's it here. And what you do is you sort of, from the vagina, identify it and uh, throw a couple of sutures through the ligament and uh, attach it to the vagina. Uh, you can do it bilaterally, but most people just, uh, one side <coughs> is enough usually. What it does is it deviates the vagina to that side. Um, which is not a problem for uh, intercourse, and uh, success rates are pretty good, anywhere from 61% to 97%. Uh, if the uterus is pre present and they wish to preserve uh, the uh, uterus, you can do the same thing, uh, but attach the sutures to the isthmus of the cervix. And it's, do it's just all the, what it basically does is just attach the cervix here and, uh, and give you some additional length. So the benefit of this is it preserves vaginal length uh, as opposed to hysterectomy. And uh, it also, uh, you know, manages the apex. Uh, another approach is the abdominal approach for apical suspension. Um, there's uterus preserving, which is the sacral hysteropexy, and non-uterus preserving, often done after a prior hysterectomy, which is the sacral copopexy. Uh, and also, when you have a concomitant uh, hysterectomy, you do a uterosacral ligament suspension. So in this diagram here, which I don't know if you can see very well, after these sutures uh, represent uh, the cuff after hysterectomy. And so as you close the cuff, you attach it to the uterosacral uh, ligaments, which run from the uh, sacrum to the cervix, usually. Uh, it, it courses along the, along the ureter. So this is one, of, you know, one surgery that you have to know what you're doing. Uh, or else you might bag the ureter, and uh, that could lead to problems. Uh, your ureteral injury has been noticed to be as high as 11%, but uh, people, there have been quotes that that number is uh, actually too high, um, but more like 3 or 4%. Uh, the success rate is pretty good, 84 to 100%, and this is after long-term follow-up, uh, 60 to 90 months. And... Uh, for apical suspension after a hysterectomy, you have the sacrocopopexy, which involves the use of polypropylene mesh, but not transvaginal. This is abdominal uh, use of the mesh abdominally. Uh, the uh, va the uh, space between the rectovaginal space is dissected, vesicovaginal space is also dissected, and you place a Y-shaped mesh with two arms, one below the vesicovaginal space, one in the uh, uh, space between the vagina and the rectum, and then you attach it uh, to the anterior longitudinal ligament on the sacrum. Uh, this has very high success rates uh, for prolapse, and the benefit is that it also manages, um, you know, prolapse, multi-compartment prolapse. So if you have rectal prolapse, um, anterior prolapse, it manages an apical prolapse, everything is pulled up. And uh, uh, this is, has been described as a gold standard. Obviously, with the minimally invasive surgery, robotic, and lapars laparoscopy, uh, this is often more utilized these days. And if the patient has a uterus, as shown by this dashed line here, uh, you can do a sacred, uh, you can do a, you can suspend the uterus in a similar manner, but obviously, uh, you can attach it to the posterior of the uterus and pull everything up. But this would not take care of the anterior compartment as much if the uterus was not present. And then you have your obliterated procedures. Uh, Copoclysis I reserve for much older women uh, who are not sexually active. And this involves uh, basically stripping the epithelium off the vagina and, and the uterus and imbricating Placing imbricating sutures 
which pushes everything back into the uh, into the pelvis. And then the part where you haven't stripped off, you use to seal the vagina, and often it appears like a like a sh uh, like a wall uh, at the end of the procedure. Um, you can do it if the if the uterus is present or if it's absent. It's uh, either way, it's it's possible. And uh, most of the patients that go through this are very happy. Uh, success rates are between 88 percent to 100. Uh, and follow-up is, uh, you know, long-term follow-up has shown high satisfaction rates. So uh, what about mesh? Uh, mesh is very controversial in our field. Um, for example, I'll give you a Cochrane study which showed that uh, the uh, mesh has shown that after a mesh repair, the awareness of prolapse in these patients is uh, less likely. Um, and the rates of repeat surgery for prolapse is also less likely after a mesh group and this is based on multiple randomized control style trials as reviewed by the Cochrane group. <clears throat> so, but when they looked at repeat surgery for combined outcome of prolapse, stress incontinence, or mesh exposure, more women in the mesh group required additional surgery. Um, so what does that tell you? I mean, it's, uh, like I said, the controversy is still ongoing. In uh, 2008, the FDA issued a warning about adverse side effects associated with transvaginal mesh, and that opened the floodgates to a lot of lawsuits and things like that. Uh, they updated this warning in 2011 saying that these adverse events are not rare. Uh, the vaginal mesh does not provide benefit over traditional repair, meaning that they, they also can recur almost as uh, similar rates as uh, the primary repair that I showed you earlier. Uh, in 2016, uh, they issued an order to reclassify these medical devices uh, as uh, a class three, which means they're high risk. So obviously nobody's gonna wanna do, and a lot of mesh uh, device companies went out of business or just volunteered to go out of business at this point. And lately, uh, abroad, in 2017, last, late last year uh, in New Zealand, the transvaginal mesh was banned, uh, totally, including the uh, uh, medieval slings, which was very uh, aggressive. And in the UK, uh, the NICE group, which oversees quality uh, and in the uh, government-run healthcare, has advised that transvaginal mesh should only be used in research. And this is a, a, an advisory that they plan on putting out this year. So as you can see, I, I don't think we're, the U.S. is very far behind uh, on this, and it's only going to be a matter of time before it's uh, not allowed to be used anymore. So uh, as you assess these patients, there, you should consider that there are other uh, dysfunctions that could occur with uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, then the primary ones I will talk about are overactive bladder and uh, stress incontinence. Obviously, sexual dysfunction is a big issue. Uh, defecatory dysfunction is, a, is another issue, uh, and uh, pelvic pain. Uh, so how do I manage prolapse on the OAB? Uh, if the prolapse is not symptomatic, I treat the OAB first. Uh, if, this, if this fails and, you know, the patient has had uh, multiple trials of anticholinergics, I could offer a repair to see if that helps. Um, if the prolapse repair does not correct the overactive bladder, then I offer uh, second and third line overactive bladder therapies, including Botox and uh, interstim neuromodulation. Um, I mean, the question is how many patients would be willing to undergo the same therapy twice if it did not work the first time? And you have to think about, when, as you think about what you do, you have to think about cost, uh, efficacy, and you know, time delay, it leads to frustration in these patients. So there are some arguments that uh, you should correct anatomic issues first before progressing, but uh, you know, surgery versus taking a pill, I often go the pill route first to see if that helps. Um, so with prolapse repair and uh, OAB, some, there are quite a few studies that I looked at. Six out of seven showed improved improvement with OAB with prolapse repair. One showed no improvement. Uh, it was a short-term follow-up of 12, uh, 12 months and as high as, uh, uh, I believe it was three years. Um, another study looked at 175 patients with OAB and prolapse, and 133 underwent anterior repair and 24 went posterior. Uh, and in both groups, the OAB improved significantly, um, although more so in the anterior repair than the posterior repair. So there is some benefit to fixing the uh, prolapse in terms of addressing the urinary symptoms of OAB. 
And another important thing to uh, screen for is occult uh, stress incontinence. Um, reduction of prolapse may unmask stress incontinence because if you think about it, the bladder is dropping, the ure the ure usually the urethra stays intact or stays at its alignment. And when the bladder drops, it sort of kinks the urethra. And there's this sense of, you know, um, if you pushed it back into alignment, the bladder and into its natural position, then you might unmask uh, stress incontinence. Uh, so usually I assess for, for stress incontinence during an exam. Uh, if you cannot demonstrate it during an exam, then you may need to do urodynamics, especially if the patient complains of stress incontinence and you cannot uh, objectively identify it. Uh, if you do identify a called stress incontinence and, uh, that's present, then uh, you need to have an informed patient discussion and about an anti-incontinence procedure so that's, such as a sling. So uh, there's been a number of studies that looked at uh, prolapse surgery with or without stress incontinence. Uh, there's been a, quite a few landmark studies. Uh, and this systematic review looks at uh, a few of those studies. Uh, as you can see, uh, preoperative stress incontinence after combination surgery versus prolapse alone. So combination surgery is prolapse and sling or a birch procedure. Um, so when you look at the totality of these studies, uh, looking at the diamond, you see that it favors combination surgery if objective SUI uh, is present preoperatively or even if it's objective or subjective, as long as it's present. Uh, they usually turn out much better in terms of the uh, post-operative uh, um, continence uh, rates are much better if they do combination surgery as opposed to prolapse alone. But on the other hand, uh, the adverse events are favor uh, doing prolapse surgery only. Uh, for example, uh, urge rates of uh, prolonged catheterization are higher in patients that have combination surgery. Um, serious adverse events um, are higher, um, and so you have to weigh one versus the other. Uh, you, may, you may require a secondary procedure to deal with, you know, complications from combination surgery. So, so combination surgery could prevent uh, need for reoperation for stress incontinence, because it's nothing frustrating like fixing a prolapse and they come to your clinic and they're leaking all of a sudden. Uh, it's almost like you messed them up. So it's, uh, it's something that they, you should, you know, kind of uh, make a habit of counseling the patients uh, about that this could possibly happen and we could get a sling to take care of it. But on the other hand, you may have a secondary procedure. Either the sling causes you to go to retention and we need to cut it or the sling gets exposed or you have a catheter for a week. Uh, those are discussions to have with the patient. Also, we have to manage expectations, define success. Uh, some degree of loss of anatomic support is normal. Uh, it's everybody, almost every woman will have it after uh, delivery. Uh, if you try to make it perfect, back to zero, this is often associated with worse uh, outcomes. And uh, a lot of studies have shown that. Uh, and symptomatic cure is more clinically re relevant than uh, anatomic cure, which is something we've we, we're late to, I mean, that we've recently um, come to grips with. Uh, so when definitions of atomic, anatomic success are too strict, they're not often clinically relevant. So the patient, is, it's, it's how the patient feels. That's the bottom line. Uh, for example, in this study, uh, there were uh, 497 patients that came in for, uh, you know, the annual pelvic exam, and they did a POP-Q staging on all of them. And these were the numbers, so 6 percent, 0, 43 uh, percent uh, stage 1, 48 percent stage 2, and 3 percent uh, stage 3, 0 percent at stage 4. So this women did not come with complaints of prolapse, but we found, you know, only a minority of them had uh, a perfect anatomical uh, support. So what's the best measure? Um, you know, I go by symptoms, uh, and you can do that by... Uh, obviously the surveys, uh, patient questionnaires and history taken. Um, you can look at the bulge, uh, use your anatomic measurements to pop Q, look at satisfaction and quality of life, and, uh, and you can do this all with uh, doing your physical assessments. So just because the bulge is gone doesn't mean that everything's okay. Um, 
there's still underlying issues, like I said, incontinence, which hopefully was addressed at the time of the repair. Uh, defecatory dysfunction, if it's if the patient has constipation, chronic constipation is a major issue. If the patient has chronic constipation, uh, you, it's best to manage it uh, because their prolapse repair is not going to last long if they're constantly straining to go to the bathroom. And uh, in this case, I often refer to uh, GI or uh, colorectal if something else is going on. Um, sexual dysfunction obviously should be addressed because the repair is not going to fix it. Uh, and if you're using mesh still, uh, you always do, uh, be on the lookout for uh, mesh complications after, after repair. Um, reassess patient outcomes and goals and expectations all the time when, they, when you see them. So in conclusion, um, I hope we'll be able to recognize women with symptomatic prolapse, uh, differentiate between the types of prolapse. Uh, always remember there's an apex, which is hard to see, but you know, with maximal uh, Valsava, it's often easier to identify. Uh, try to identify other associated issues, uh, defecatory dysfunction, constipation, sexual uh, um, problems, uh, incontinence, uh, and then history and physical exam, like everything else, is a cornerstone of evaluation. Uh, if you're undergoing, if you're advising patients, be, be familiar with treatment options. And not everyone needs surgery. Oftentimes, like I say, they, they hear about it, they hear their girlfriends talking about it, and they know they have it, but they just want a reassurance that nothing's wrong with them. And that's enough. Uh, if it's symptomatic and they don't want surgery, uh, pessary is an option, uh, on, or pelvic floor muscle therapy if, you, uh, if they desire. Uh, so the traditional repair, which is the anterior corporophy, has a, a varying success rate, and it depends on uh, what your definition of success is. Uh, if you use a strict anatomic criteria, uh, it's lower because it's not going to be perfect. Um, and uh, we are now using more clinically relevant criteria such as you know, patient symptoms, patient's bother, uh, quality of life. Um, and we always have to assess and, uh, and manage patient's experience and their expectations uh, all the time when advising them about options. So uh, I hope I, I was able to kind of go over everything quickly, and uh, I'm available for questions. <coughs> questions, comments? Yeah. Thank you. Shauna Lorenzo, colorectal surgery. We welcome you to Chattanooga. We're Thank happy you. that you're here, and I look forward to working with you. I have two questions for you. The first one is, given the data you presented, when do you use mesh in your practice? And number two... Do you ever see men? Um, I don't see men. I mean, I see men for standard urological problems, prostate, prostatitis, or stones, or uh, BPH, but I, I don't see them for, uh, for chronic pain, those kind of problems. Uh, one of my colleagues does. Uh, as far as the mesh issue, I don't use uh, transvaginal mesh. Uh, obviously, for this, my, for the same concern that I presented, I do use abdominal mesh with the sacrocopoplexy, and um, I, I'm, I haven't had any problems with that. When, when do you use it now? Is that was that the, the picture that shows the yeah the the Y mesh going to the sacrum? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's okay. when I use. Oh, it. Oh, you are still using. I still that. use it for that. Yes. When you do use it, which, which mesh do you use? Uh, it's a poly polypropylene mesh. Uh, that's what I use. Yeah. But Michael. Interesting talk. Uh, I'm glad there's uh, people out there that want to treat this condition um, or conditions. Uh, my question is more technical. There's a lot of GYN people out there, and particularly with this uh, posterior repair, yeah. how difficult technically is that to find the right layers and stay out of the rectum? Um, it's not difficult. The key is to just stay superficial. Um, I, you know, obviously the, the uh, fear is a rectal injury, but it's very rare, uh, as long as you stay superficial. And that's why when, we, when people were initially put in mesh between those layers, uh, they had to go a little deeper so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, uh, extrude into the vaginal, and uh, that's led to a lot of problems. And so it's just a very fine balance of staying as superficial as you can. This certainly is something that, uh, in my case, seeing a lot of women for many years long term with breast cancer follow-up is something that, that certainly is yeah. a prominent problem for the patient that has those symptoms. Yes. Uh, I know some of my patients have had a, 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 a 
your urethral swing with uh, with mesh. I, I assume that that is part of the 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 group of patients that is pretty much not recommended at this point. Is that true? No, the sling uh, is well studied. We have 15-20 uh, year data on it, and it's actually uh, one of the strongest uh, evidence out there that so it the works. So the urethral sling is still it's still uh, yeah it, in the u.s at least and okay. but it's you know it's getting some blowback in this in new zealand and the uk okay but it's it's the then it's the vaginal prolapse where exactly the mesh has been basically yes. abandoned abandoned yeah okay all right uh, at least uh, if you're doing a vaginal <laughs> repair mm -hmm. if you're doing it abdominal then you might still use it if i'm doing it abdominal i can still use mesh okay. but if it's vaginal i don't use mesh at all uh, other questions or comments well, this was an interesting talk, interesting topic. Thank you very much for Thank being here for again. Me. Welcome to Chattanooga. We're glad to have you. Appreciate it.